Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just another beautiful Lord's Day, the beautiful weather we've had the last several days and the rain the other day, and we're just so thankful for all the physical blessings that come from you, and we're just thankful for the strength and health that allows us to be out and about and come together this morning, join in with the saints and sing praises to you and open your word, and we pray that all things said and done here this morning will be pleasing to you and be uplifting and beneficial to uh, each of us, thankful for the ability to be able to join online with some folks that would love to be here and are unable to, and we're grateful for that, and we pray that whatever it is that's keeping them from being here this morning will soon be removed and will be back here with us soon. Pray that you'll be with the sick of our number, continue to watch over and be with them, be with those that are caring for them. So thankful for the prayers that have been heard in the past over, over members of the flock here, and they are joined with us once again, and we're you're so grateful for that. Pray that you'll be with those of our number that are traveling. Watch over and protect them, bring them back safely. Be with our first responders, military, law enforcement. Watch over and protect them and their families. Keep them safe. Pray now that you'll be with the teachers of the hour, that the things they've studied and reflected on and reviewed, they will be brought to their remembrance and, be, and they will bring those to us and we will apply those things to our lives and be better stewards of your word, be better Christians, better examples to those that we come in contact with from day to day. Forgive us of those sins we've asked forgiveness of. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. amen. Can I use this? I haven't. That's good. Is this one good too? Yeah, it's good. I don't want it? Either one. Oh, either one. Either one. All right. If I want to use it on that podium, I can. Yeah? All right. If I turn it on. Is that working? Yeah? Whoa. For now. All right, good morning. Uh, this is the first Sunday we've been in the auditorium, Sunday morning. Uh, we've been in the auditorium since January 7th. Yeah. So 13 weeks. Uh, and I've grown accustomed not being above you, but at your same level. And so I want to keep that for Bible class at least. Uh, I do think one of the benefits when we were in the fellowship room that whole time is that for Bible class especially, uh, there wasn't as much hesitation to make comments or ask questions uh, because we were very uh, close together. So uh, we'll go ahead and do uh, Bible class right here. I guess that's fine. And uh, we're still working out some kinks, as in, I guess, lights. But nonetheless, we shall continue on. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Romans 14. Romans 14. If you are visiting with us, uh, we don't have any special uh, continuity that I know of with classes. Uh, we are currently just kind of doing some individual lessons here and there with whoever does Bible class. Uh, last time I think I taught, we mentioned something about 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 concerning sensitivity as it relates to our relationship with people, others, and how we communicate such things. Uh, so one thing we did not get to is Romans 14, and so I figured today, let's just cover all of Romans 14. And so we're going to look at Romans 14 in its entirety. At least I'll read the whole text. Uh, the goal isn't to do an in-depth, verse-by-verse, um, word-by-word type of study, but I believe with Romans 14 especially, there's some very uh, 
basic principles that do not require a lot of uh, in-depth looking uh, because what Paul is trying to get at, I think, is pretty clean, uh, plain and simple. So, here's what we shall do. Uh, we'll read Romans 14, the whole chapter. Uh, we're going to go all the way up uh, to chapter 15, verse 7, actually. So, I'll read that just in one continuation. And before we do, though, just to get your mind in the book of Romans, uh, book of Romans written to the Christians at Rome, chapters 1 through 8, has to do with the explanation of how the righteous live by faith. And so if you keep that in mind, the reason for writing this is to explain how the righteous live by faith. And that's shown pre-Mosaic law during the time of the uh, patriarchs. Abraham lived by faith. Uh, during the time of the Mosaic law, people lived by faith. And then after that, as Christians, we live by faith. And so chapters 1 through 8 goes through a very long explanation, how all have sinned, how, how Jesus Christ has made people righteous, and how we walk by faith, chapters 9 through 11, especially deal with that particular role as it applies to Israel. He says not everyone that's born of physical Israel is a spiritual Israelite. It's only those who are of, of faith. So chapters 9, 10, 11 talk about that. And then chapter 12 and uh, basically 12 through 15, uh, 16, is the what we'll call practical application part of it. Uh, that's why in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. That's your reasonable service. And so he begins that. And within this section of Romans 14, just to make sure that we understand the, the flow of the context, chapter 12, he's talking about your body as a sacrifice, that there's many members and gifts, chapter, verses 9 through uh, 8, that you have the, the identifying characteristics of what Christianity is, that love be genuine, Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Then he goes, talks about chapter 13, obeying the government and submitting to them. And the end of chapter 13, I think, is a very important, pivotal application as he transitions to chapter 14. Uh, he says, especially, chapter 13, verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for whoever loves one another fulfills the law. And I think therein is our, our key that loving one another fulfills the law. So that being said, we'll go ahead and let's uh, begin reading chapter 14, verse 1. <clears throat> uh, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him to stand. One person esteems one day better than another. Every person, another person esteems it all days alike. Everyone should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. None of us lives to himself, none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live, whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? We will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give of an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. Rather, decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of our brother. I know and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. But what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us persuade what makes for peace and for mutual uh, upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or anything 
that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because he is eating not from faith. Whatever, uh, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of those who are weak and not to play, please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, for as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever is written in former days was written for our instruction, that through the endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of encouragement and endurance um, grant you to live such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the uh, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. All right. Uh, let's go back here and make some observations, then we can have some discussions about this. So, uh, chapter 14, verse 1, chapter 15, verse 7. There's your bookends for the whole section. Welcome him, but not to a quarrel over opinion, verse 1, chapter 14. Chapter 15, 7, welcome him, even as Christ has welcomed you. The terrifying part about qualifiers such as that is how did Jesus Christ welcome and receive people? Did he have any... Reservations that he looked down upon them. He opened them and welcomed them with open arms. That did not, did not mean he accepted everything they did, but uh, there is a sense in which, when verse 7, we welcome one another as Christ welcomed us for the glory of God. And I think therein is our key to all of this. When we, um, well, before we get to application, let's go back to the text here. So, chapter 14, verse 1 The one who is weak in faith, welcome him. So the term for uh, weak in faith is, I think, something that we do need to make sure we qualify and define. Uh, weakness is typically seen as a bad thing. Is that right? Like, no one likes to be weak. No one wants to own up to that. But in this context, what Paul is saying is not saying that this is a, a, uh, an insufficiency of one's ability to follow God. This weakness does not have to do with one's level of morality. And so when we think about people weak in, in this context, Romans 14, verse 1, the weak in faith isn't talking about someone that has loose morals or their morality is um, broader than other people. This isn't talking about one's level of commitment to God. I think that's also something we have to be careful of. We use the phrase weak in faith you know, be it those who are weak as those that are struggling, those that are lacking in faith. This passage here is not referring to that kind of faith. The weak it's referring to is not the lack of commitment, not the lack of morality. Uh, best way that I can define it is the limitations of your conscience. That's what this is, limitations of your conscience, which means that there's certain things in life that may be doable for a Christian. But personally, I could not engage in such things. And all of us have those kind of limitations within our conscience, whatever it might be. Uh, and that's what, where Paul's getting at Romans 14. This specific thing that he's referring to is uh, verse number 2. One believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. All right? And I think in this particular context, you have a couple things going on within Rome. Uh, you do have the, the Jews and the Gentiles. And there are some of those ceremonial laws and uh, following of certain foods they eat or don't eat. And even as it gets further to the uh, festival days, verse 5. So here's the context he gives us. One person believes he can eat anything. The weak person eats only vegetables. And that term, weak person eats only vegetables, means that his conscience will allow him to only eat vegetables. If I say it like that, does anybody have a, have a problem with that? Questions so, so far? Okay, good. All right, so, so here's the, here is the, uh, the commands given throughout the chapter. Verse 1, receive him, but not to dispute over opinions. 
And that word opinion is a word that occurs, I think, two or three other times in the New Testament. Uh, it refers to discernment of judgment over judgment calls. So when we receive people that may be different, and as Paul says in this situation, if someone says, I only eat vegetables, receive him, but not just to say, I need to teach him a thing or two, but welcome him, for he serves God. Verse 3, uh, two more commands are given. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And then let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has approved or uh, welcomed them. And um, even in life, we get that concept, right? If you're out at a very, uh, if you're out with some friends and they pass out the cake and you're like, I'll take a piece of that cake. And you go to your friend like, no, nah, I'm going to pass. I'm trying to cut back. If we're not careful, we think within ourselves saying, how dare they judge us like that? He's not going to eat cake when I'm eating cake. You know, there's a tendency for us to read into the choices that we make. And in this context, you can see, imagine being a Christian, like, you can eat anything you want. Why are we eating only vegetables? Man, I thought they, were, I thought they knew better than that. Likewise, the one who eats vegetables might be saying, well, I can't believe they're eating meats. You know, we're, we're, look, look, look how disciplined we are in our pursuits. Whatever motive you want to ascribe to it. The bottom line is, in the verse 3, what's, the, what's that final phrase? Whether you do this or that, for God has welcomed, received, and accepted him. That's the bottom line. God has received and accepted. What God has received, I must receive. Yeah, so I think that's what you have with, uh, with, with David, just to repeat here what David said, is uh, that sometimes the best situation is to keep it to yourself. You know, and that's where we do uh, not pass judgment on each other. Uh, here's the thing about opinions. Two things. One, everybody that believes their opinions are right. Anybody hold any wrong opinions? No? And secondly... Uh, your opinions don't have to be verbalized every time you think of them. That's the hard part. Um, so I think Dave brings up a good point. We keep it between ourselves and God. And that's what Paul even says. So, uh, going down here to verse number 4. Who you to pass judgment on the servant of another before his own master he stands or he falls. And I think in this context you see him using an example. If you have people who are heads of households over here, and they have servants under them. This servant is accountable to which master? That one. This one? To this one. This servant can't say, hey, my neighbor, your, uh, your water boy isn't getting the water right. That's not his call to make, not his job to, to say. Maybe, maybe in this context, another example to kind of help us see that, that concept is husbands and wives. Do you know uh, that the wife is subject to her husband, right? Mm -hmm. And that the husband's the head of his wife, right? Which means I can't say, man, you're a terrible husband. You need to be, husband you need to be husbanding me like husbanding. <laughs> like me. Or your wife is like, man, she's not a submissive woman. She needs to be more submissive. Well, wait a second. I thought that I was in charge of my wife, not you. Right? We get that. And when you talk, we, especially with marriage, especially, there, there's some, some couples in the, in, that I just scratch my head and think, I don't understand. Like I, as a husband, I couldn't function in that kind of role. Or, or you know, I, there's something that just blows my mind on how that operates. But you know what? If they're honoring God the way they should, they can go about it however they want to go about it. As long as the Bible is being fulfilled. <clears throat> and we get that. It's angry.
Yeah, yeah. I think uh, she asked the question. Yeah, no, it's not. They're doing something over in South Sudan. Yeah, yeah. She says, uh, Mike, Mike Hunter? Paul, Paul's not Mike. Not Mike. Paul. Paul was Mike. Uh, yeah, so Ingrid brought, brings up another point with raising kids as well. And, and, and the reason we bring these examples up, not to get too detached from Romans 14, <coughs> but there's a lot of different parenting styles. Some better than others, we might say, but we might disagree with what is better than others. <coughs> Here's the thing. As Christians, we raise up our children to love God. Uh, fathers, uh, you know, raise up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's the command. How to do that specifically is up to who? Me for my children. We understand that, that principle in life, right? That, we, that parents are in charge of their kids. Now, sometimes we might be around some kids and think, maybe let's, let's help the parents out a little bit, <laughs> right? We might think to ourselves, but ultimately it's their responsibility. And so Paul, as he's going here in verse 4, uses this example. He says, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's for his own master they stand or fall, and it will be upheld because the Lord is able to make him to stand. And so notice the great um, focus that God is putting on. God has accepted them. God is making them stand. God has approved them. There is, uh, oh, okay, it's good. There is a responsibility that each of us have to make sure that we are in line with God. And after that, uh, we'll get, it goes from there. Uh, another example, verse 5. One person esteems one day better than the other. Everyone esteems all days alike. Everyone should be fully convinced in his own mind. Uh, whether you esteem the day for the Lord or you don't, you still give thanks. Bottom line for verses uh, five, 5, 6, and 7 is this. Um, how many of you have a birthday? All of you do. Look at that. All of you have a birthday. Yeah, yeah, not anymore, right? And when that birthday rolls around, it might be a special day for some of you, right? I probably don't know what day is special for you versus me. But when you wake up on your birthday, do you praise God that it's another day and it's your birthday? Yeah. When you wake up the day after your birthday, do you still praise God? So do I. Whether you esteem the day special or not. Oh, Okay. The ringing from the air conditioning, not the speakers. Do you want to cut the air conditioning off, you said? I'm kidding. He didn't say that. No, he did not say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as part of the, add it to the kink list, I guess. Um, so you're exactly right, though. Here's the point. Whether it's a special day or not, we dedicate it to God. Uh, and that's what Paul's getting at. Whether we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So even then, whether we live, whether we die, we are the Lord's. Notice that where the emphasis is at in all of this, it is we belong to God. We are received by God. We are accepted by God. We are the Lord's in life, and we are the Lord's in death. That means if we serve the Lord, then whose responsibility is it to make sure that someone else, uh, uh, and then whose responsibility is it to make sure that uh, our neighbor is serving God? It's his responsibility. So verse 10 why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? We all stand before the judgment seat of God. So, verse 12, each of us gives of an account of himself to God. We understand that concept, right? Why is that so hard to fulfill? I mean, why is there so much bickering and things in life? Because we get that, but the problem is we, we understand that judgment calls are judgment calls. But... Sometimes what we believe to be a judgment call, or someone else believes to be a judgment call, we believe to be book, chapter, verse. That's the scary part. How can I be certain about what I'm doing is truly a judgment call, not book, chapter, verse? Um, sometimes it might be, for example, um, we'll use uh, singing, for example. We worship in God, with, we sing with our voices and our hearts, etc. Is there anything inherently wrong if someone plays a church song on a piano or guitar. Nothing wrong about that. But for some people, there is. For some people, they can't imagine amazing grace on an instrument, and that's acceptable. And if that's the way it is, that's fine. To them that thinks that it can't be done, it should not be done. 
And those of us that might think it's, like, it's not a big deal, if it's a big deal to them, then I need to make sure that I'm not you know, playing in the background any Hobby Lobby music where all their songs are instrumentals of church songs because I know it might offend them. Okay, so what you said is true. It's not part of the worship service, but that's not the point. The point is, and that's what verse 1 is about, we receive him but not to dispute those things. I know that, you know that. But as David says, sometimes that's what you do. And so that's, that's not, like, and we get that. Uh, maybe even in, uh, so the worship practices of that kind of thing, uh, maybe temptation levels as well. Maybe books you read, movies you watch, shows you watch, entertainment choices. There may be levels within that where someone's like, I don't see how a Christian could watch this show. Well, that's the thing. You can't see it. But if any Christian does watch whatever show you're thinking of, Guess who gives an account of themselves to God? They do. They do. Yeah, but surely we have to make, you know, and then this is where our minds kick into gear, right? Like, yeah, but there's wrong things, and there's things that should not be done, we should not expose ourselves to. No one's doubting the fact that we should seek after God. Paul's not doubting this at all. In fact, what he says, I think in verse 14 of chapter 13, does have a lot to do with the whole of chapter 14. Chapter uh, 13, verse 14, it says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill and gratify its desires. That means there is a call for us to make sure that we don't put ourselves in positions or things in life that might lead us to engage in sin. Now, that's different for everybody. Let you know. Yeah. What do I do then? I mean, uh, I don't want to watch the program, but I don't want to insult them or say anything about it. So what do I do? Yeah, that's going to be a, a call that you make, and it's going to be depending on whose house it is, what relationship you have, and this is where that discernment comes into play. Um, you know, remember, I think last time we had uh, a discussion within Romans, or 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, and... Um, Josh Poppins not here, but he made the comment about, you know, I decided not to, to force, you know, not to say that prayer. In those moments, what are your options? You can say something and then make a decision from there, say nothing, avoid it. You can sit through it if you don't want to. Uh, the good thing is you control you, and in those situations where we have to uh, seek after discernment and for you protecting yourself, you know, I think it's going to be a big difference. Is this a, a brother and sister in Christ's house that you're at, or is this a friend that's not a Christian? That's a big difference. Is this someone that you know very well, or is this someone that you don't know very well? Is this a relative, or is this someone who's just a friend? Is this, you know, a passing thing? Is this, you know, something? There's a lot of different factors, and it's hard to give just a flat answer for it. But what you do have to do as, as, as followers of Christ is we need to make sure that we don't violate 1423, which says that whatever is not of faith is sin. If there's an activity that we are engaged in or a situation that we're put in that we're not comfortable with, then we should seek God's wisdom and advice and do what we can to remove ourselves from that situation. Maybe it is talking to somebody and asking, hey, can we watch something different? You know, I'm not comfortable with this. Some people will be fine with that. Maybe it is, you know, I just need to step outside. I need to go to the room for a little bit. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, either way, the goal in that is to preserve our own conscience, our own heart, but all done while loving God and loving the other person. That's the hard part. That's the very difficult part because there are so many facets, uh, facets involved and nuances within that that we have to uh, be careful. That's a good question, though. I'm not sure if I answered it, but... That's the best I can. Any other anybody have a comment they want to add on to that? Tyler. It's the old saying, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Mm -hmm. I mean and our big thing with that is 
we can't worry about if we offend somebody by asking them politely. If they get offended by us saying, hey, I don't really appreciate this, can we change the channel or watch something different? In, in Ms. Janelle's case, mm -hmm. if they get offended, that's not our responsibility that we offended them. Just like, I mean, we, but if you're polite about it and you move about or addressing anything, that's all you can do. We make our own choices, they make their own choices at that time. But we can't worry about offending somebody if we are polite and respectful about it. Yeah, and I think and that's, that's, um, that's a true statement, but it's hard to put into practice at times, especially when we, if you have a, a mentality where it's like, I want to do all things for all people in the best way possible. The abuse of that is people pleasing. We become all things, all men. If we take that to an extreme, an ungodly extreme, then we become people pleasers, and we seek to try to uh, appease what everybody says or does and not to offend. But as Tyler mentioned, there is a truth that you can only do the best you can. And as human beings, we should see that with each other. We can only do the best we can. And sometimes the best we can do isn't that good, <laughs> if we're being honest. I can draw you the best picture in the world that I can draw, but it's not a good picture, I guarantee you. But it's the best I can do. And if we as Christ followers, and I think this is maybe where we can take rest and comfort in and, and assurity, is that as followers of Christ, uh, we have a, a confidence that, that we are going to do this because we're trying to please God and love people. And if our focus is on loving God and loving people, everything fa else falls into place. And so, yeah, I can ask politely. It's not what you say, but it's how you say it. And if they get offended by that, I can't control that. And I can say, I apologize. I did not mean to offend. Uh, but in that situation, we still kind of go back down to uh, where, what we're getting through here is that I don't want to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of my brother. Who is next? Uh, Dennis? Thanks. Being right always doesn't really make you the winner, mm -hmm. but leading by example will. Yeah, being right doesn't make you a winner, but leading by example will. Yeah, um, there's a, that's a joke. I don't know if it's a joke per se, but it's a principle of marriage that sometimes it's better to know someone's love and to know that they're right, you're right. And what I mean by that is like I can, I can prove to you that I'm right in what I'm saying, but I want you to know that I love you more than I want you to know that I'm right. And I think there's a nuance within that and a fine line within that, that we should want the world to know not that we're right, but that God loves them. Because if they know that God loves them, then they know there's right things that flow from that. You can speak truth without love, but you can't speak love without truth. Does that make sense? Yeah, we'll go with that. Um, all right. Uh, so back in uh, 14, verse 13, is uh, don't pass judgment. Uh, rather, do this. Decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. And I understand that there are going to be limitations within our minds with this. I don't know everything that's going to cause you offense. And as Tyler mentioned, I can do the best thing. I can ask in the most polite way. I can do things in the best way possible. But if I offend you, hopefully you give me the benefit of the doubt and realize I just didn't know what I was doing, and I, I apologize, and we can change, move forward, and go from there. Uh, he said, verse 14, I know and I'm persuaded in Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. And so going back to that example about, uh, you know, Amazing Grace on the guitar or the piano. We know that that does not constitute any inherent worship. But for the person that can't see around it, don't try to convince it. Don't try to, well, they need to be, t I get what you're saying, but their conscience is their conscience. And, and sometimes it, it makes me wonder, if Paul had to say this point blank, and people still struggled with it, how much more shall we struggle? I mean, we don't have the divine mandate that says, God definitely approves of this and definitely approves of this. I mean, he says God has accepted both options, and they still struggle with it. So you would think that we'll struggle still when we don't have such divine words of God that says this is also correct and this is also correct? Sure. Uh, verse 14, I'm no one persuaded, nothing's unclean, 
Uh, for if your brothers grieve by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. Chapter uh, 13, verses eight, through, or, yeah, verses 8 through 14, is talking about love. And then chapter 15, as it talks about Jesus, is an emphasis on love. The purpose of our Christian living and our freedoms that we share and enjoy is not to exercise our rights for our own benefit. They're merely more options for us to serve people. That's the beautiful thing about it. Uh, notice what Paul says, uh, don't let your, um, do not destroy the one from whom Christ died. Verse 16, do not let what you regard as good be evil spoken. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but, uh, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the emphasis. But with day-to-day -day living, we can get caught up, if we're not careful, with thinking that I have to do the right thing, say the right thing, go to the right place, avoid the right thing, and we consider that a righteousness. Now, your faith is lived out in practices for sure, but the emphasis of the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's righteousness and joy and, the, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. That's what we're doing. There are uh, Galatians chapter 5. You can look at the, the uh, works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. There are some things in this world that no matter how you practice them, they will always be wrong. Murder. There's not a way to do righteous murder. Um, you know, adultery and fornication. There's no such thing as godly fornication or godly adultery. You know, we can go on. There's, there are certain practices in this world that no matter how you spin it, well, I, I just, my conscience bothers me. If your conscience bothers you in, in engaging in wrong, then your conscience is undeniably wrong because we have a biblical mandate in Scripture that says, thou shalt not or thou shalt. And there are some things, no matter how you do it, they're going to always be right. When you practice true, genuine Christian love, that's never wrong. I think we've talked a lot about how what we do when we're going to somebody with one of these issues but I also think that it's how we receive that person. A lot of times our pride or ego or just hard-headedness gets in the way and us saying that our way is the only right way. I think that's a big thing for a lot of people to get over. Instead of having an open mind, a loving mind to the person who's coming to us because there's a lot of times, most times, as long as it's not contraindicated in, in, in the Bible, there, there's more than one right way to do things. How we're going to do this, how, how we're going to do something with the building or whatever it may be in our lives. There's sometimes pride and ego gets in the way instead of us loving one another and just in having that open-mindedness. Yeah, I would say pride and ego probably always get in the way in those situations. So whenever we, we pass judgment, we put ourselves in the seat of a judge. And there's only one lawgiver and one judge who's able to save and to destroy. James chapter 3, 4 ish. And um, that's, that's God. Stacy? <clears throat> Going along with what uh, Tucker said, I was thinking about um, it also, and you mentioned earlier with what Janelle had said, depends on your relationship with those people that you're talking about. For example, my wife, and I don't think she's in here. But I would, say, I would say it anyways. One thing I can say about her, even though she does some of the craziest, wackiest stuff, everything she does is with good intentions. I know that. I have to really step back and think that sometime to think, how are we here? How are we doing this? When I know 100% you came at this whole thing with best intentions. In, in since 1979, she's never done anything with bad intent. Right. Even though it winds up being some of the most obscure, off-the-wall junk we get into, it, everything is done with good intent. So I have to think about that also when I'm talking with people, kids, grandkids, just friends, whatever. I mean, if you know this person, you can, you know particularly if it's friend or family, you can kind of maybe rule that out. I, I know they're not intentionally trying to 
destroy whatever this is. I know, okay, like you said, that's their opinion, and then you can kind of go at it from there. Yeah, and again, I, I, you bring up some good points there for sure, uh, both uh, Tucker and Stacy, uh, because what we're looking at trying to do is humble ourselves and put pride out of the way. And that's what chapter 15, that's why I read through chapter 15, verse uh, 7. It says, uh, verse number 3, chapter 15, 3, For Christ did not please himself, but as it's written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So Jesus says, I'm going to shoulder these things for you. And in that same sense, when we as followers of Christ, when we are putting up with, if I can use that terminology, uh, we have an ob a obligation it says, verse 15, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings, the faults, the scruples, whatever your translation might say, of the weak and not to please ourselves. And so there's an option within that. And I think one thing that helps us in that bearing up is that we have this understanding that if you're here to serve God and I'm here to serve God, then I'm going to assume that everything you're doing is with God's best interest at your heart. And... Um, you know, sometimes people have a heart of gold but a brain of brick. And they may be the, the most sincere, but some of the actions, I'm like, I do not, what, how is this a good idea? And that's what makes us different as people. Is there's people who make decisions and thoughts, and, and, uh, and our job is to help uh, work through those. Now, just to make sure we don't lose the context here of Romans 14. How much Romans, time, Michelle, you said that about? Article brain brick. I got it. <laughs> yeah, no problem. It was inspired by you. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully she'll, she'll think I have a heart of gold too, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but within Romans 14, especially, he's referring to the confines of the church. Don't, don't forget that. Now, we're making application to those outside, and that, that's fine and good, but don't forget that Romans 14, he's writing to the church, and these are inter brethren relationships, we'll say. And so who we're going to and who we're dealing with are all going to be on the same plane. Ten minutes. Fifteen? Five. Five minutes. Five minutes plus the thumb. Gotcha. Six. Uh, all right. So, uh, but yeah, good, good thoughts here. And we have a few minutes left. Um, let's see. Comment? Stephanie has a comment. I was just thinking about sometimes I know we like to loophole things. And so while we might not tell someone, like, I'm right and you're wrong, we have to be careful how we <laughs> talk about the decisions that we make around others, too. Because I think in pride we puff ourselves up thinking, oh, I'm the stronger brother here. I can handle this when they can't. But also when we take these matters of opinion and we make them into more than a judgment call when they're not, where Jesus said in Matthew 15 about... He quoted scripture, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. I think we do that a lot in the American church um, when we talk about the judgment calls our congregation makes compared to other congregations like, oh, we're more righteous. We have three services on Sunday. Oh, we're more right, or three service a week. We're more righteous because we do it this way, or we have it at this time, or we have two gospel meetings a year. They're not doing any gospel meetings, and that's a judgment call whether or not they do those. And in effect, I think it, I know it doesn't qualify as this kind of stumbling block right here, but it is a stumbling block of sorts. We make people feel like they aren't righteous because they didn't make that same judgment call. Yeah, it's it's scary because when we start establishing standards and even talking the way we talk about those can also be. Uh, be a path that might cause others to think less or more of something. You know, if you have congregations where they've decided that, hey, we're going to do it with our evening service, and you're like, hmm, I can't believe they're, they're going that route too. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Yeah, but, I mean, why would you want to go less? Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. That's some scary stuff. I can't believe they did this this way or that way. That's fine. But what we have to remember is that we are giving an account of ourselves to God. And, 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 and when we receive them, if I can take a fuse kind of here with what David said and what Stephanie said, fuse together, you know, something else. You know, 
Yeah, hey, listen, we not, need, not, need not to say anything, but be careful not to say things within your heart as well. Because just because you receive them and you say nothing doesn't mean your heart is judging. That's the part where I think it's very scary. Uh, going back up to um, uh, chapter 15, verse 7. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. And so there's a, a not, not just a, a verbalization, but there's within your heart. You're like, I don't just put up and deal with them, but I'm glad they're here. I welcome them. Stacy. Yeah, going with that and what Stephanie said, I mean, even, I mean, that to an extent at least or a degree is, I mean, that is adding to or taking away from, from what the Word says. If you're saying your opinion, okay, three services is better than four or two is one, whatever, whatever, you gospel meetings, I mean, that is, you're saying that those things are, you know, part of, part of what should be done, and so you are adding to, I mean, the, you know, the Bible doesn't specify, you know, how many particular times and meetings and all that kind of stuff there, so your, your opinion is, I guess, preceding what, yeah. what the Word says. Yeah, and even just to add to it, we got uh, Lacey in the back over there, and probably the last comment, um, but as it's my microphone's going over there to her, uh, one thing also is uh, keeping in mind, uh, we say that. Uh, but in the same sense, to the person who thinks they need to do it three times a day, they need to do it three times a day. If they need an evening service, then they need to make sure they, they don't violate their conscience and um, skip out on that. And so there's a, there's a multifaceted application of this whole process. There's a passage in John that says to judge righteous judgment. What does that mean? And within the context of this, conversation, how would that apply? Um, John seven twenty four, do not judge by appearances, but judge with righteous judgment. And of course, in that context, what Jesus is talking about is, um, uh, let's see, he's talking about his teaching is not his, but God's. Uh, they saw, call, say that Jesus has a demon. He says, I did one work, and you marvel at me. Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers, and that you circumcise the man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so the law of Moses may not be broken. Are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's body well? Do not judge by appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And I think what he's saying here is, is uh, the surface level aspect isn't always the right aspect. Uh, when he's in this, this context, he says, you have no problem circumcising on the eighth day, shall not much more heal somebody on the, eighth, on the uh, Sabbath day, excuse me. Um, and so their judgments were, were hypocritical. And I think that's what that, that, that context there is about, is they're not judge, they don't judge by appearance, don't judge a book by its cover, we could say, but by the content within it. And applying that back to Romans 14 as we kind of conclude this whole session here in section is that what we're trying to do is that we're not, uh, we're judging with righteous judgment, uh, not just, um, uh, we look at ourselves first and foremost, and if we do see someone engaging in sin, obviously we have, a, we have a responsibility to go talk and ask them about it, and sometimes it may take some conversations, more than one, and uh, some understanding of how we can get to those levels, but the bottom line that Paul is getting at in Romans 14 is that whoever has doubts is condemned because he's not eating from faith. And we have to make sure that whatever we do proceeds from faith. You have your righteousness before God, and whatever you do, you do it for God, and that can be lived out in a number of different ways. Um, so, uh, all that being said, um, thank you for the discussion, for the questions. Uh, let's go ahead and end with a brief prayer. <clears throat> God in heaven, thank you for today, for loving us. Thank you for giving us your word that provides wisdom and instruction. That gives us the, the hope, Father, that to know that how we live in this world is, not, uh, is, is, is guided by you. Father, help us to not pass judgment on our brothers, to not look down because of their lives. Uh, but, Lord, help us to love you and to love our fellow brother. May we sacrifice when we can. May we not put a stumbling block or be a stumbling block. Uh, may you give us all a heart of sincerity. May we see the best intentions in people and in situations. Father, help us to uh, love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that love will permeate throughout each other. 
May we reflect you in our actions and reactions, and we pray that you'll be with us now as we break from this class, as we go into worship, that our worship is acceptable, that we joyfully engage with heart, mind, and soul through the praise and reverence of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. We're certain, certainly glad to see everyone with us this morning, especially those of you who may be visiting with us. We do count you as our honored guest. We would like for all of our guests and our members alike, if you would, please fill out an attendance card located in the pew in front of you and pass it over to the nearest aisle. Also, if you would, please silence all electronic devices so they're not a, going off during the service. We do have several prayer requests. Please remember Sister Annette Phillip. She, uh, she was in the hospital, but now she is back home. Stacy Wilson is in LRH, been diagnosed with AFib. They are still running tests to see what the best treatment will be. Uh, Patty Van Allen is not feeling well. Fran Gabaldon will be having surgery in a few weeks. Uh, Jean McCarter's sister, Kimberly Lamar, uh, her cancer unfortunately has returned. Treatment is yet to be determined. Also, Rachel Zapata is not feeling well and requests our prayers. Uh, remember the shepherds would like to meet with each family to know your ideas, concerns, and questions. They'll be here the third Sunday of each month. Please call the office to let them know what time works best for you. Ladies' Day at Eagles Lake will take place April 20th with Pamela Clark. Uh, also, their gospel meeting will begin on April 21st with Jimmy Clark as the speaker. Uh, Church of Christ Homeschool Educator Retreat will take place at Orange Street Congregation April 26th and 7th. Please register by yesterday if you plan to attend. Griffin Road Church of Christ Annual Lectureship is Saturday, April 27th. Rick Kenyon will be one of the speakers. It begins at 9 a.m. and lunch will be provided. There will be a planning meeting for VBS after this evening's service. So they are looking for teachers and helpers, so if you can, please try to attend this evening. Senior Saints will be taking a church van to Webster Flea Market tomorrow. Uh, they will leave at 8.30 a.m. If you would like to go, please see, please let Steve or Woody or the office know. Uh, also, Sharon Roy is at home. Uh, homebound and needs our prayers as well. I do have a card. Dear church family, thank you very much for the prayers, cards, calls, and food. While I was sick, I am grateful for my church family. That is in Christian love, Miss B. Pratt. That's all the announcements I have for you this morning. If you have those need to be made, please get them in. We'll make them at the appropriate time. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. Okay, the first song this morning will be hymn number 312. 312. Three, one, two. We'll sing verse 1, 2, and 4. They tried my Lord, they tried my Lord and Master.
looking to be today, trusting thy grace along the way. Shall we pray? Actually, before we pray, I really wanted to thank, I know he doesn't want that, but I really want to thank Terrence and, and, and guys like him that are willing. We didn't know, we didn't have a song leader at one minute before the service started. And so, I mean, he's taken right over. I mean, you'd never know it unless I mentioned it, but I definitely want to thank Terrence and, and, and other guys like him that are willing just to like, like anyways, so, thank you. Shall I pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Another beautiful Lord's Day. We thank you for this time that we have to come together and worship you. We pray that all things that are said and done here this morning in this service will be pleasing to you. We're thankful for Rick and his ability to proclaim the word in a way that is, I mean, just cannot be misunderstood. And we're thankful for his heart and his willingness to, to do that as much as he has while we are in search of a full-time minister here pray to be with the elders as they you know make decisions on that and that you'll be with us and that this congregation here can do 
much good and not only for, for us, but for visitors and those in the community around about us. Pray that you'll be with our sick. Pray that you'll be with Fran Gabaldon. She's got some more tests and procedures coming up. Jeff Bingle, he's looking at more tests. Patty Van Allen, we're glad she's back with us. Stacy Wilson, pray that you'll be with him and his uh, heart situation, blood pressure situation, that can be uh, taken care of. Um, Terry, who is a relative of the Longs, had a kidney transplant. Continue to be with Debbie Bush, Bill and Carlene Long, Ron Ford, Annette Phillip, Janie Wise, Margaret Kuhn. Continue to be with Melissa Kraft, Kathy Nestor, and Jim Turner, and also others that were mentioned and our shut-ins, and just pray that you will be with them and hopefully as a, uh, or no, we know that as a Christian family that um, prayers are heard and prayers are answered. We know that you hear each one, and we just pray that will be done in all these different situations. Pray now that you will be with our military and law enforcement and first responders. Pray that you'll be with our nation and the rulers of our nation. And we just pray that they could understand that they are only in positions of power because you allow it to be and that they would. We just pray that those that purposefully do ill will against the nation and against your will could be have their hearts changed or be removed from positions of power and that people with good at least moral standards and could be put in those positions of power pray now that you'll be with us throughout the remainder of this service pray that all things said and done will be pleasing in your sight pray that you will Forgive us of those sins we've asked forgiveness of. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts 8. Acts 8, verses 18 through 24. Acts 8, 18 through 24. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought that you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. If you'd like to mark in your song books, the song of invitation will be here number 382. 382 will be the song of invitation. And the song before the lesson this morning will be hymn number 400, 400. If you're able to, please stand for this song. 400. We'll sing all three verses. Yes. 
Let us pray. Uh, God in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity we have to worship you. And Father, we're grateful for this uh, moment where we are able to assemble and uh, worship uh, back in the auditorium. Uh, we're thankful that you've given us that, that uh, privilege once again. Uh, we pray that you'll be with us as a congregation as we search for a minister, that you will send the man that you've prepared for us, that we may uh, grow in unity and faith and understanding, we may grow in mercy and truth. Father, help us to be a light to the community wherever we're at. Uh, may we never forget, Father, that it is um, the power comes from you, uh, not from anything else. May you work through us with our strengths and with our weaknesses. Uh, bless the elders as they lead and shepherd and the deacons as they serve. May every member build each other up in love. And Father, may we uh, use the relationships we have in our life, uh, the opportunities, and through your providence, help us to increase our faith and draw people closer to who you are. Uh, thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for the spirit you put within us. Thank you for your word that gives us the insight to who you are. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We are, uh, Bible class I mentioned this morning, we're back in the auditorium after 13 weeks. Uh, last time we were here for Sunday morning worship was January 7th of this year. And uh, it probably looks different. It sounds different. If you can hear the whirling of the AC unit, that means it's still comfortable. So uh, just keep that in mind. I want to say thank you to everyone that's been uh, flexible and patient through all that, uh, especially through all the sound and technology snafus and issues that we've had to navigate. Um, and we're grateful that we're slowly making our way back to it. Less than title today is called Back on Track. I figure it would be appropriate to call that since we're back in the auditorium. And if you think about the idea and the concept of a track, a track, uh, I think of trains, rail cars, and how their wheels are designed to sit within a track. And wherever that track goes, that's where the train goes. There's no question about it. I mean, there's really not any steering because you just go. Um, maybe you think about some of those rides and theme parks where they give you the freedom to drive your little boat, but honestly, it's stuck in the track. And so you can just keep bouncing this way and that way, but it's going to go wherever that track leads you. But when you're in a train and those wheels get off of that track, it's going in a direction that it may be the right general direction, but that's not how it's designed to roll. And when things break off the track, there's a danger in going astray and never getting back to where it needs to go. We had uh, our scripture reading today was Acts chapter 8, 18 through 24. In Acts chapter 8, 18 through 24, you have Simon, formerly known as Simon the Sorcerer. And while he was uh, striving to impress people with his magic and good works, he heard the word of God, he obeyed it, but then he realized he saw something else that he wanted, that they could get the Holy Spirit when the apostles laid hands. And so he says, let me, let me have that too. And of course, Peter rebukes him in Acts chapter 8 and says, your heart's not right with God. And pray to God that there might be sin forgiven of you. He says, yes, please pray for me. Simon got off track and needed to get back on. Today, I want us to focus on four pieces of instruction to help get us back on track. And maybe to make sure that we are on track in the first place. Uh, that way we follow and pursue what God wants. So, four simple instructions here. Number one, always accept the words of Jesus. Maybe that's obvious and simple. Uh, if you want to start opening your Bibles to Matthew 16, we'll look at a few passages there. Matthew 16, uh, beginning in verse number 14. Um, but I, I liken it unto prefab furniture. If you ever purchased anything from a department store, you know, Walmart, Target, Ikea, and you put it together, it comes with an instruction book or a page of instructions. And if I venture to guess, all of us probably fall into one of four categories when you put stuff together. One, you don't need the instructions. You can do it yourself. It's not that difficult. I got this. And no matter what, I'm not going to look at the instructions. Number two, I don't need the instructions. I can do this. Then you realize, like, huh, this doesn't look right. I don't think that leg is supposed to be on the top. Then you consult the instructions and say, okay, I'll fix it and go back to where I need to go. Number three, you read the entire instructions in its entirety. 
from top to bottom, and then you start your project. Or number four, maybe you're this person. I'm just going to buy it pre-made or pay someone to put it together for me. You're probably one of those four categories, right, within those instructions. Uh, there's really not anything else outside of that. Uh, look with me in Matthew chapter 16, uh, beginning verse 14. Uh, Jesus asked a question in uh, verse 13. Who do people say that the Son of, Man is, uh, Son of Man is? And so the apostles say, some say John the Baptist, some Elias, some say uh, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Verse 18, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things from the elders and from the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. And Peter took him and began to, took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. In our role as followers of Christ, as we're trying to be on the track that leads to heaven, as Christians striving after a Christ-like spirit. We have to accept the words of what Jesus says, whether we think they're right or not. Sometimes, uh, we, just because you recognize who Jesus is, doesn't mean you always listen to what he says. Matthew 16, I think, is a very potent point. Who are you? Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. And Jesus says, bingo, you got it. You know, I am him. And then he begins to explain what his real purpose is on earth. And the next thing that we see Peter doing is, Jesus? No, that's not going to happen to you, Jesus. Peter, get behind me, Satan. You know who Jesus is, but do you listen and accept his words? You know, that's where I think we have to make sure we are, 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 are careful. Just because uh, our confession can quickly be forgotten when we try to remind God of his plans. We don't need to remind God of his plans. His plans are for us, and we need the ones to be reminded. You know, when I, uh, maybe you put some of those tables, chairs, whatever it is together. Uh, every now and then, you'll find some instructions that I'm pretty sure don't come from the manufacturer. Only because when I look at the picture and I read the instructions, it has nothing to do with the box I'm looking at. And I think, these might be good, but this isn't for this. When we try to create our own instructions for something that God has already given us, it will be confusing. It will not turn out right. It will be frustrating. It will always end in failure, and ah, that's not what I thought it was going to be when I started this thing. But if you always listen to the words of Jesus, and you follow that through, then we can be um, like that person who follows after him. Uh, notice that, it's, um, that time away from Jesus can sometimes deteriorate our focus on what he said. When you look in Matthew chapter 11, 1 through 6, we'll just reference it for, for time's sake, but Matthew 11, 1 through 6, John the Baptist is in prison. prison. He sends the apostle or his disciples to say, are you the Christ or do we look for another? And I think what you see happening is even though John is the cousin of Jesus, the one who baptized Jesus, the one who says, his sandals I'm not worthy to loose. This same John, are you the one we're looking for? We start getting off track when we start losing touch and connection with Jesus. Every day, we have an option to fuel ourselves with God, to fill ourselves with God. Every day, we have an amazing access to who he is and what he says. And there's no amount of study and no amount of reflection that will change what Jesus says. That's the beautiful thing about this, is whatever Jesus says is what Jesus said. 
What I, if I tell you something different from what Jesus says, guess who you should believe? Jesus. If the wisest professor in the world or the oldest living Christian says something different than what Jesus says, you stick with what Jesus says. Because this is the words of Jesus. And to stay on track, we need that. John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus says this, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him and will come to know him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And he, um, and the words you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. John 15, verse 7, If you abide in me, my, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done. Step one, always listen to the words of Jesus. Instruction number two here to get us back on track with life. <clears throat> we have to beware of busyness. Uh, look with me in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. You have Jesus entering into a town and a house. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, as they went their way, Jesus entered a village. A woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious, and you are troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. We live in a culture of busyness. And as I was looking up some different information regarding it, I came across this article from Harvest, Harvard Business Review from March of 2023. And here's a quote from this article. It says, the reasons for the rise in time poverty, as they call it, uh, that's a social scientist have termed it, are numerous and nuanced. But corporate cultures that value busyness are at least partially to blame and in theory should be easy to correct. Put simply, busyness has become a status symbol. When you ask people how they're doing, like, I'm busy. You're like, man, they're always doing something. And in the back of our mind, you're thinking, I respect them because they're busy people and they do a lot. Well, the good news is if you're a godly person, you'll be a busy person. The problem is that just because you're busy, that doesn't make you godly. That's the scary part about it. Serving people is about serving God, not yourself. How many times have you met or encountered people where they want to uh, impress upon you how busy they are and how many things they can juggle and how many things or how many people depend upon them or need them for things or without them this would fall apart or that would fall apart? That doesn't sound like the glory of God. Sounds like the glory of me. Beware of busyness. Martha was upset that her sister wasn't helping in the work. And Jesus says she's chosen the better part. Would we rebuke people for taking time to sit and listen to the word of God? Would you rebuke and ask God to help them say, Lord, tell her to stop listening to you and have her serve? Does that make sense? Beware that busyness doesn't creep into it. Uh, it's, you know, serving, uh, maybe you can think of it this way, serving and loving God will never result in being too busy to serve and love people. Maybe we've forgotten that simple fact, that if you truly are busy serving and loving God, you're never too busy to serve and love people. Because if you're neglecting people in your service to God, you're off track. Matthew 15 when uh, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, hey, why do your disciples transgress the commandments of the elders by not washing their hands? And Jesus says, why do you transgress the commandments of God by your traditions where you neglect your parents in the, in the temple text and you give it to God? Uh, Lord, it's Corbin, as it says in the text. It's Corbin, meaning I'm giving it to God, not my parents. You cannot love God and neglect people. Jesus never did. If we are too busy to help people, then we're not loving and serving God the way we should. And we have gotten off track. Uh, one time, I came across a quote um, 
There's a book called Eat That Frog, and it says that the biggest waste of time is doing something well that doesn't need to be done. And I, at the moment, I'm like, that's a dumb idea. That's a great idea. Huh. Wait a second. Doing something really well that doesn't need to be done. You know, I am the king of, of tangent cleaning. I can say, yeah, I can clean. I'm going to sweep that floor for you. Man, those baseboards, that's a leaky baseboard. You know what? Let me go to the store real quick and get this, fix this baseboard. That's great, but guess what my job was? Sweep. Our job is to serve God and love God and serve other people. Uh, Ecclesiastes 4, 6, Solomon said it this way, that better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and striving after the wind. Proverbs 23, 24, and 25, do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. Know when to quit. When your eyes light on it, it's gone. It suddenly sprouts wings, flying like an eagle towards heaven. Our pursuit in this world isn't to acquire stuff. It isn't to acquire accolades. It isn't to acquire experience even. It's to connect and love ourselves to God, serving him by serving others. That's exactly what Jesus did. And so, so as we are, beware of busyness. Some things to reflect upon in your own life. Does, has busyness become a crutch to distract you from working on you in your relationship to God? It's a lot easier for me to go through mindless tasks here and there and distract myself when really I need to be working on me. It's easy for me to say, let me help you and you and you. And Oh, I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to do this because I'm too busy helping people love God. Has busyness become a crutch to distract you from working on you? Has busyness become a, a crutch from addressing the real needs within your church or your family? I got to do this, 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 but the real needs... I'm glad we're back in the auditorium and that there's things going in. It's frustrating. But do not forget that the need is not an auditorium. The need is not for this plumbing to be done. The need is for you to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To tell the world about that God. That despite the distractions that we see, don't let this knock you off track from the focus that there's lost and dying people. And there are people within the congregation who are slipping through fingers and things because well, we don't have this going on, that going on. Have you given it your all to love and reach and help and serve? Are we too busy with things going on? Do not let that business be a crush to distract you from having a meaningful connection and obedient faith with God. Well, I love God. I, I, get, I have a lot of things I do for him. Doing something for somebody doesn't mean you love them. A servant will serve his master. That doesn't mean he loves them, but if you love somebody, you will serve them. Do not conflate your busyness with love. If you love, you will be busy. But just because you're busy, that doesn't prove your love. Number three, we want to make sure that we never glory in your gifts. Never glory in your gifts. Luke chapter 10, if you're still there, verse 17. Jesus sent out 72 people, gave them gifts of healing. They came back and they said, The 72 returned with joy, Luke 10, 17. And, the Lord, uh, and they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Sometimes we get caught up in the, the newness and the, the, the fun things sometimes what God brings. And uh, the beautiful thing about the way that God has designed people in the church, every person that lives today is a person that God knows and cares about and should be on this earth. Every person in the church has a purpose and a place. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18 but as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one as he chose. And while he's referring to 1 Corinthians 12, the hand, the foot, the eye, the nose, the ear, the application is every single one of you who are in the body of Christ, God has put there for a purpose. You have a unique talent and gift and ability that only you can serve God with. Every gift is given from God, right? James 1, 17, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. But do you remember that every gift that's given is given with love.
to be used in love to produce love for God. You see the cyclical nature of that. God gives us things because he loves us. We use those things in our love for God and people, and that love that, we, that God gives us, that he works through us, given to others, is to produce more love for God. That's how it's designed. Beware that you never glory in your gifts. We are merely conduits. You know, um, sometimes tools can be an important trade. And I have my pocket there. You know what this is? A wrench. Crescent wrench. One of the fancy ones that has a little ratcheting wrench on it. Woo, this, this saves you so much time. You get a tight little thing. Man, I just have to do this right here. I don't have to do this every time. But when I'm done with the project with this wrench, this wrench doesn't say, so Rick, you impressed with me? How good did I do? Look how much I helped you. Look how much I've accomplished because of what you did with me. But you know what this wrench can't do? Can't take out a screw. So I'm like, well, you, know, you did help, but you're not everything. The screwdriver, though, however, man, if I need to take a screw out, as long as it's got the little crossy cross thing on it, the, flip, the Phillips head, oh, I can take care of it. Now, if I need to put a nail into a wall, I guess technically, right? I mean, we've all done it before, right? Back of a screwdriver, it's not a hammer, though. The point is this. It's not the tools that we glorify. It's the person behind the tools. You take your car to get fixed. You don't say, hey, what tool did you use to get that fixed? You say, thank you for fixing my car. Thank you for building this house. Thank you for constructing this thing. Tools are part of the process. We are each tools for God. And we are designed sometimes very differently. So differently that you're like, this is not even close. And that's fine because you know what we need? Each other. We need everybody because we cannot get into the mindset that we glory in our gifts whether what we've been given or what we can do. Uh, that's where we have to make sure that we are not falling short within that. Um, we can get off track when we focus more on our gifts than the one who gave us those gifts. Did you realize that your obedience is not talent-based? Your love is not talent-based. Your worship is not talent-based. There's not a particular set of skills that you need to love God or serve God. You just need a heart for God. That means whoever you are, wherever you are, never glory in your gift, but give that glory to God. And finally, number four, as we get back on track, making sure we don't fall off that, that, those rails, avoid comparing yourself with others. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 7. Um, as Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Sorry, I said, I think I said 1 Corinthians, I meant 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 7, Paul says to the, uh, the church there, look at what's before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. As Paul is dealing with uh, people who are attacking his apostleship and his legitimacy. He says, let them recognize the same thing. Then drop down to verse 12. He says this, um, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and when they compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. No man goes to a mirror looking for someone else other than himself. You don't go to the mirror looking for other people. You go to look at you. You go to see you. When we go to the Word of God, don't go looking for other people. Look for you. James chapter 1 says, Whoever looks in this perfect law of liberty and continues in it, not being a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, that man shall be blessed in his deed. But at times, we've all been guilty. We're like, ooh, this person really needs this. Maybe even now, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this point or that point. Or, or she really needs to hear this. That's the man, too bad they're not here. They're missing something they really need to hear. Thought that before? 
but you are here. And you are hearing this. And you are the one that needs to transform your life into that of Christ. You can't change other people into Christians. Only God can do that. You can point them to the word. You can bring the mirror to them, but you can't look in the mirror for them. You can only look in the mirror for yourself. And when we try to compare ourselves with other people, we've missed the standard, we've missed the point. We've missed it completely. Um, Romans 14, verse 12 and verse 22, we looked at in Bible class this morning. So then let every one of us give an account of himself towards God. That's the beauty of this walk that we live in. That the track I'm on is the track that I'm responsible on. Now, yes, my faith can influence others. And yes, my actions may have consequences that cause others to grow closer to God or further from God. But it's you. That you compare yourself with to God and no one else. The goal is to be Christ-like in all things. And I think if we can get that part right, everything else takes, takes care of itself. I mean, I've heard many times where people say, like, well, we don't want to look like denominations. And when the emphasis is to be anti-denominational instead of pro-Christ, we've missed it. Because when you are pro-Christ, it takes care of the rest of itself. When you serve God with your heart, and when you serve the uh, people with your heart, and when you show people that you're striving after to be like God, what he says and what he does, everything else falls into place. I mean, yes, if you're on a train and it falls off the track and it's going towards the same direction as the tracks, technically you're going in the right direction. But that is not how that should go. When you're, if you're at a, stop, at, a, uh, at a light at a crossing and you see that wheel on the other side of that rail just blowing through, cutting through the concrete, please call someone. Don't say to yourself, well, at least they're going in the right direction, you know? <laughs> I'm glad they're going in the right direction. That's not, that's not, that's not, no, no. Yes, the direction, but that's not the way to go. It, it should be done. Yes, we're going in the right direction, but we do things God's way. And when we look at ourselves as individuals or we compare ourselves as a congregation, not just even to the world, but even to other churches, we've missed it. I don't have to give an account of anybody else but me and my family. And you don't have to give account to anybody else but you. We, as God's people, want to be on track so that when he comes, we'll, we'll be where he is. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, our final verse for this morning. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not know this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail to meet the test? great thing about Christ is you can come as you are, and you can leave as he is. He is the one that transforms those who are broken and destructed, those who have been off track, and he puts them on the track to salvation. He's put each of us, because he died on the cross for our sins, because we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, because we have been born again, and we have been placed in the right path, and because we walk that light path the path of light, at the end of us, there awaits a glorious blessing. But as we go along, remember, it's always about the words of Jesus. Don't let, beware of busyness. Make sure that we do not glory in our gifts and don't compare yourself with others. Look to God to be the all-sufficient thing. This morning we invite you that if you're not a Christian, if you've not put Christ on in baptism, begin your walk with God and get on track, and we can help you with that today. Maybe you have and maybe you've been off track. Maybe you've fallen off the rails, need to come back. This opportunity invites you to, to do that. We can pray for you. We can encourage you. We can love you. We can embrace you. And together, we can be the church that God wants us to be. And so if there's a need that we can help you with, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Christ will meet you
hvis vi stiller det. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing number 268. 268. We'll sing all four verses. 268. Good morning. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11 reads, He shall bear their iniquities. He shall bear their iniquities. This was said 750 years before Jesus Christ and is in anticipation of him. Jesus Christ bore every sin that every human being ever committed, plus 
every sin that every human being is committing plus every sin that every human being will commit. And he did this voluntarily. And the Lord's Supper is a memorial of what he did. So let's give thanks now for the unleavened bread. Father, we're thankful that we have the opportunity now to focus our attention back upon the cross of the Savior. We pray that you be with each one of us as we partake of this unleavened bread that appropriately um, represents the sacrificed body of the Savior of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine that represents the Savior's blood. Father, we now approach the, the throne of grace. We're mindful now of the, the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross. We pray that it be with each of us as we think about what this blood represents in his name. Amen. And now is a separate matter, but still an act of worship that we see documented in the New Testament scriptures is the giving of our means. So let's, let's give thanks now for the material blessings that the Lord has given. Father, we're now thankful for the physical blessings that uh, you provide, uh, not just the um, jobs, but even the air that we breathe, the, the life that you've given us. Pray that you be with each of us as we think about the passages in your word pertaining to giving. 
pray that be with the decision makers here that that uh, they will use this money to uh, advance your cause in his name amen Final song this morning will be hymn number 200, 200. As always, I want to thank Rick for his ability to proclaim God's word in the simple way that he puts it to us. If you're visiting with us, we want to say that you're our honored guest, and we do meet again at 6 p.m. tonight. We'd love to have you back. Number 200, we'll sing all three verses. I'm sorry, we'll sing verse 1, and then we'll have our closing prayer. Just verse 1. Hallelujah, Righteous Holy Father, we thank you for this wonderful Lord's Day you've given us to come here, sing songs of praise, and to hear your word. We ask that we had cleared our hearts and minds and we took in the, the lesson that was given to us and let us strengthen ourselves so we can strengthen thy kingdom. We ask you to be with the ones that are mentioned to be sick. We ask you to be with the ones that are taking care of them and bring them back to their natural walk of life and it be thy will. Be with us now as we go our separate ways. Guard God and direct us and bring us back at the next point of time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.